So just to give you a bit of context about why we're all here today, uh, uh, in, in recent months, the RIBA, which is the Royal Institute of British Architects, has been focusing, about, um, focusing on really uh, what really matters at the moment in the construction industry, which is about promoting good quality design and about trying to explore ways of being able to engage with the public and with local authorities uh, to try and engage with the process to make sure we can deliver better outcomes in terms of better communities and better environments for us all. In July, we, we actually held a conference down in Chelmsford, a joint conference with the RTPI uh, and with Anglia Ruskin University. And that was exploring the importance of collaborative design. So it seems fitting that actually this month, we're gathered here today to talk about Accordia, uh, marking 10 years since it won the Sterling Prize uh, back in 2008. Um, so this scheme, it's now been embedded in the cultural and architectural fabric of Cambridge, if I may say so. Uh, it's become well known across the nation. You often see it appearing in design and access statements and uh, in reports talking about exemplar housing schemes due to a number of reasons. Uh, the mixture of communal spaces and shared spaces, the landscaping, and the collaborative approach that this, this design team took, working with the planners and each other to deliver the scheme. And in fact, only a couple of years after completion, the Brooklyn's area conservation area was expanded to include the, um, the whole scheme as part of the conservation area. And if recently after that, um, the Article 4 directions have been put in place to limit the uh, the the ability of residents to be able to adapt their, their properties without going for formal planning consent, which is, I think, a recognition of the sort of the, the, the large scale moves that were made about the scheme in terms of the cohesiveness of it as a whole between the different architects. So before I hand over to Peter, who's going to introduce, um, introduce the project from the planning side of things, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge um, Peter Studdard, Mike Keyes of Field and Clegg, Bradley Studios, Richard Lavington of Macrina Lavington, Michael Woodford of Allison Brooks Architects, and Jonathan Gimblet of Countryside Properties, all for giving up your time this afternoon. I, I th thank you all very much for doing so. I'd also like to thank our sponsors who are somewhere in the audience. We've got Taylor Maxwell and Traditional Brick and Stone, who have kindly supported the funding of this event, along with Field and Clegg Bradley, Macrina Lavington, and Countryside for the production of the film this, evening, this afternoon. So I'd like to thank you all very much for your support. Thank you all for turning up this afternoon. Um, and without any further ado, I'll hand over to Peter. Okay, thanks, Tom. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, well, I mean, uh, hello. And uh, I think what a great event this is. I mean, it's, there's not enough uh, work done on looking back at how schemes have actually performed. And I think it's great that the RIB has uh, organized this event. Um, and. Um, my, my job is just to give a very quick uh, planning introduction. Um, my brain is probably not what it used to be, so probably a lot of things I say may be incorrect, and if anyone wants to correct me, do feel free to do that, but I should try to give my memory of, of what was quite a long uh, saga with developing the site. Just a bit of background with the site history. Um, the site was originally a garden for Brooklyn's house, um, which is uh, this building here. Just get your bearings. We're somewhere down here at the moment, Shaftesbury Road, Brooklyn's Avenue. This slightly blurry map is the extract from our 1996 local plan. Um, what it does show is the state that it was in in the 1990s, because the site was, uh, having been originally a garden for the Brooklyn's house, um, which I think was originally bought, built by the Foster family, who were big bankers in Cambridge in the 19th century. Um, the site was bought by the government at the back end of World War II, I think mainly for a military hospital, I think was its main purpose, and covered in porter cabins. And you can see on this plan all these um, port cabins that scattered over the site with some surface car parking in amongst the, uh, the trees and the mature landscape that was already there. So in the, in the, by the mid-1990s, all those uh, port cabins had been decanted from their original use and filled with uh, civil servants. And so a lot of people would have gone there for their driving test and, and various things like that, and tax inspectors. Uh, but the buildings were falling apart um, and uh, were in very bad shape. And so the uh, uh, um, strategy for the local in the local plan was that to say, okay, let's uh, build some new offices for civil servants, which could be on the on the corner of the site or it could be somewhere else, and free the site up, the rest of the site up for housing. Uh, and it was actually the largest housing site in the 1996 
uh, local plan, which shows how relatively modest our aspirations were back in those days. Um, the other sort of feature of the site, as well as Brooklyn's House, which is up here, uh, was this building at the bottom, which is a, the nuclear bunker, which you may have seen as you, when you came in, uh, which the original part of that was built in the 1950s as the regional seat of government in the case of nuclear warfare. Uh, it was hugely expanded, I think, during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis in the 19, uh, six, early 1960s. Um, we had always sort of worked on the assumption that it could be demolished, um, but uh, as we as we'll hear later, I think about a month after the government sold the site to Countryside, uh, DCMS came in and listed the bunker as part of their nuclear um, sort of nuclear war um, listing regime. And so it sits there today. We'll go and have a look at that as we walk around. Um, so that the Brooklyn's house and the nuclear bunker were the sort of two main built fixed points. Otherwise, it was very much uh, a, a, a very interesting landscape. Next, please, Richard. Um, we did a planning brief for the site in 1997, which is 21 years ago, which is rather frightening. Um, it was adopted after a lot of public consultation. It was very much landscape led as a planning brief. Um, recognizing the, the uh, landscape attractions of the site with Hobson's Brook running to the west, uh, the, the main avenue of trees, the sensitivity of Brooklyn's house. And so the way in which the brief kind of carved the site up was into large areas where buildings could happen, a sensitive area where some buildings could happen, but a careful thought in its relationship with Brooklyn's house, some open space uh, to protect the setting of Brooklyn's house and a, a major piece of open space in the center of the site, and there's the nuclear bunker still, still there in the corner at that stage. Um, one of the kind of hostages to fortune we put in the planning brief was that the, 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 should be, uh, the, the general height limit should be three stories, and that rather came back to haunt us when we, when we actually got down to the detailed discussions with, uh, uh, with the architects, but uh, there it was in the uh, brief. It was looking for conventional street blocks. I think, one, going back to this document, which I hadn't seen for, I don't know, like 15 years, what I find interesting is that we did actually put uh, two crossings of the brook for cycles and walking to connect in uh, permeability through the scheme onto the footpath that runs down uh, empty common. That remains a kind of contentious issue as to whether that should actually go ahead. Um, I'll probably get an update from re local residents on that as we move through. Also, bringing in a road uh, into the scheme from Shaftesbury Avenue, which is another thing that rather went. Uh, as I said, at this stage, we weren't sure whether the offices were going to be relocated on the site or relocated somewhere uh, else. Low parking requirement uh, and sensitivities around traffic generation on Brooklyn's Avenue. And parking and traffic was always one of the big themes of the, of the planning discussion about the development. Next, please. Um, so the planning timeline, I mean, the government um, put the uh, site on the market and Countryside and Kojima were chosen as developers uh, for the housing and for the offices in 1999. Uh, the outline application was submitted by Countryside's own in-house architects uh, in 2000 and finally approved in October 2001 for 382 homes, 30% affordable, and then keeping the offices in the southeast corner of the site. Uh, Kojima went, went ahead and built the new offices using Kerry Jones from Leeds as the architects, um, and that obviously freed up the site then for the housing to go ahead. Um, Field and Claire Bradley appointed as housing architects in February 2002, and uh, uh, Richard will talk, and, or, or will talk some more about that, or Mike will talk some more about that. Um, and then the reserve matter submitted September, of 2002 approved in uh, 2003 and then construction really took quite a long time and because the countryside sold on to Reedham's home in I think it was 2009 um, and I think the final the final sort of contractors van left the site in about 2013 so it's still not that long ago that it was finally finished next please um, on planning process issues I think one of the main points was when we gave outline permission in uh, 2000 with the countryside's initial layer, illustrative layout. Um, we were happy to accept that as uh, an illustration of what the capacity of the site was and, this, and their layout broadly uh, agreed with, uh, complied with what we were putting in the, what we put in the planning brief, but it was pretty ordinary as a, as a scheme and there was a lot of uh, objection to what it was showing at committee particularly and there was one or two members who I think had a particularly important role in all this, one of them I think Nicola Harrison who I think was, gave a very aggressive uh, critique of the plan at planning committee. Um, uh, and good for countryside, they went away, uh, having got their outline permission, but they went away and appointed a decent team of architects. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, a very helpful uh, move forward. There was a very good and um, creative dialogue between my team and the design team, I mean, particularly Peter Carter, um, who was the principal planning officer, and Jenny Parsons, who was the main case officer. Peter was so committed to the scheme, he actually 
at his own expense, took himself off to Holland, I think it was, to look at the brick that you were wanting, because it wasn't actually available to see in the UK, and he wanted to make sure that it was the right brick for the site. I, I hope I refunded his flight, I can't really remember. Um, but it was that kind of amount of passion that was put in by the planning team uh, who were uh, negotiating with the architectural team. It'd be interesting to hear what, a bit more about what it was like from their side. Um, but in a way, a lot of our role as, a, as the planning team was a kind of became a sort of a mediation role. I think that we were trying to uh, give space for the architects. We knew that we were dealing with good architects. We knew that they understood the sorts of things that we were wanting. We were wanting a very urban scheme. Um, but uh, we had a lot of uh, aggression from the surrounding residents, maybe some of them here today, but to hear your perspective as well. Um, there was one particular resident who, I think at the end of the process, Peter Carter looked back on the file and found 72 pages of objections from him uh, over the period of the reserved matters applications. Main concerns being traffic, uh, low parking uh, allowance, and so concerns about parking spilling off into the surrounding area. Um, we also lost the permeability, so I think one of the main criticisms, which I think is legitimate for Brooklyn for, for uh, Cordia, is it really is a cul-de-sac. So the entrance in here became the entrance to the offices, not what it probably ought to have been, which is an entrance in to join up the scheme and make it more mixed use. So that uh, really came out as part of uh, the objections from residents who were concerned about the uh, traffic on uh, uh, Shaftesbury Road and Clarendon Road. Little do they know what was coming in future years for the dam, but that's another story altogether. Um, so we had this kind of mediating role as a planning team. So I think that, I would, looking back on it, that I would see that as being as our main role. The other people we had to mediate with is, is the county council's highway engineers, who uh, were very concerned about the narrow uh, mews, and we had to convince them that actually the narrow mews was going to be OK. In fact, it was going to be part of the strategy to make people to park, park their cars in where they should, rather than just leave them in the mews. Uh, also, arguments with the lighting, street lighting people who didn't like the idea of having street lights put on walls. And, and we managed, as we walk around, you'll see, we managed in the early phases to get street lights up on, on walls. Uh, in later phases, the poles, steel poles, have reappeared, unfortunately. So that was something that we won the battle early on, but then uh, lost later on. So the, there were areas like that that we had to intervene as a, as a planning team to help the architects do what they could do best. Well, that's my kind of slightly dewy idea of what our role was. Um, but certainly, committee was a pretty hectic day. Um, we had all the residents from Newton Road screaming blue murder that civilization, as they knew it, was going to come to an end because of the height of these blocks, which obviously were going above the three-story height limit that was set in the, uh, in the uh, scheme. The, uh, this layout is interesting enough. It's the one that had a an eight-story tower where the bunker is, uh, has, has been kept, which I always thought was actually quite a nice idea, having suddenly terminating the view. Even that went and became a, a four-story terrace even before it was then taken out altogether um, when the bunker was, uh, was listed. So there was a big discussion about that as well. So I think it was a good dialogue. I think that, you know, there was, we were lucky uh, that we had a good house builder who was prepared to take some risks, um, an, an architectural team who were trying to do something really new and uh, and we were happy to support them and take some risks. Um, finally, for the next slide. Um, yes, these were just the issues that, that came up, uh, which I've more or less talked about. One issue about the distribution of affordable housing was kind of quite interesting. Wherry Housing Association only wanted two-story houses, and so that rather pushed a lot of the affordable housing to the back of the site where uh, two stories were, uh, um, were acceptable as far as the planning brief was concerned. So a lot of the earlier part of the scheme, the early phase, was all private housing, the, 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 the scheme that actually got the sterling prize. Um, and one could criticize the fact that the distribution of affordable housing wasn't possibly as, as, uh, as, as mixed as it might have been, although, again, I, I get the Housing Association, I think, was happy to have uh, their housing in slightly more coherent uh, bundles. And obviously, the late listing of the, nu of the nuclear bun bunker being a major problem. And then next and finally, and just a quick, a quick word about legacy. I was asked to say something about that. I think it has had a, an important impact on the quality of housing in Cambridge. Um, I think particularly if you go around the Southern Fringe uh, and the later work the countryside did with Proctor and Matthews, Tate Hindle uh, on Clay Farm, you can very much see the influence uh, and the kind of confidence, I think, that Accordia has given to architects and to house builders to design good contemporary townhouses without having to go for sort of frills. Um, and some people might say that it's a bit boring, that it's kind of a cordial light, I suppose, is the expression that one might use on some of the schemes. But I think what it has done is, is it has uh, established, I think, quite a strong Cambridge vernacular, which is a very confident 
kind of quite European, quite international vernacular, uh, which is pretty, I think, pretty popular. Um, whether you could build it everywhere else, I, I remember Mike Crooks at Countryside said that they'd never sell in Chelmsford. I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, but it's certainly set a standard, which we were very happy to have and to point to when we came to negotiate with the other house builders on the Southern Fringe. So that was just my brief introduction.